prayed for the day God would give him a son. Blessed Isaac was his name, the greatest gift he'd ever known. But then came the day, who would have dreamed? God would say, you gotta give him back to me. And, and on this mountain you must prove that it's you and Isaac or it's me and you. So when I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart but my father's proud and on this altar where he lay just to find it wasn't him God wanted me now most of us I dare to say we've got an Isaac in God's way but it's on this It's not your Isaac that God wants, He wants you. So when I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart, but my father's proud, and on this altar where He lay, just to find in him God wanted me so when, when I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart but my father's proud and on this altar where he lay just to find it wasn't him God wanted me and on this altar where he lay Just to find it was in him God wanted me I hope you've been praying about the services. I'm excited for tonight. Brother Adrian, you come and you preach to us. Yes, sir. Appreciate that very much, Pastor. All right. Well, first off, good evening. Who did well this evening? I thank God for this service. I appreciate that song. Uh, sometimes I get lost in contemplation, and uh, that is a really powerful truth in that song, Driving on Here, down, um, Driving Here from the Hotel. I was thinking about this thought, actually gnawing upon the matter of, you know that God's name, one of his names is Jealous. It's not something he is. It's one of his names. God introduces himself in the, books of Ex in the book of Exodus, as that is who he is and doing a study upon jealous and many understanding that God loves us. It's not like he just tolerates me. He loves me and he wants my absolute attention that he says my name is jealous. I'm not preaching on that even though I thought about it while sitting there. <laughs> However, it's what a truth that's gathered in there and because many times the Lord wants us. He wants our heart. Hope you've had a wonderful day today. Um, just by way of reminder, we've gone through these times. I, I hate to kind of go from one message and move to the next without at least just trying to at least remember to some degree. Remember from yesterday, I hope that we added one word to the I remember when and well, actually two words. I remember when God did a certain thing. We need his presence in this place. Sunday morning, I know it's not the happiest thought because obviously, I mean the happiest thought, it's something that's a, a revolutionary thought in our mind that really would change the way I just interact in the world. I, I don't want to take God's name in vain. Murmurings and disputings is that which quenches my light and I want to make sure that I am not quenching the light that God's given to me and the opportunity of influence in the realm of those that he has. Um, today, a little bit different. I hope this would be an encouragement. I really do. Um, and also, you know, 
you know, at the end, you'll awfully see, I'll see a definite challenge um, for those that are in this position. But let me just introduce a thought before I even tell you the passage or anything. But uh, during 2020, um, I was asked by the military at Offutt Air Force Base um, to come and speak. When they were asked me to speak, um, it was the chaplain, the Air Force chaplains said, Adrian, we don't really care what you speak upon. It's just that there's a lot of mental health issues going on inside of our units. Many suicides are taking place. People are try I mean this is in the middle of pandemic time frame and so there's a lot of terrible things that were happening and they said we really don't even mind what you preach upon or speak on but we would like for you to do a three-day conference and so when we did I mean they had distancing and so was a football field that they were able to rent out to be able to speak um, when I was asked to do it I was honored however it made me to really dig deep into this matter especially as it pertains to mental health I know sometimes it's one of these areas to which we find to be taboo or we find in some way that we want to spiritualize some things and however just like we need to take care of our physical temple there is a difference when we look at the brain and the mind okay when the spiritual one is an organ <laughs> this is an or this this heart is an organ my brain's an organ and and even though i speak today and just have this preface statement that i am not obviously speaking upon health issues that concern the brain even though i realize physiologically there are some tendencies that people will have and i do believe that help is necessary and self uh, help should be sought if necessary. I am not going to speak upon those, but I do want to speak upon a joint marrow type discussion. What I mean by joint marrow, like when, the, when, um, when you go through in, in Hebrews and speaks about the joints of marrow, it's like things that are so very close. Where does one start and where does the other begin? I understand there's a very technical type issue. However, I do believe in scripture that we do not need to retreat from things that we find complicated. We do not need to then just back off when it has a more complicated explanation than we feel comfortable. So therefore, with God's help, I want us to look at a word that I'm going to make up here this evening. Here's what I want to discuss. I'm going to call it, it's going to be a spinoff in the matter of depression, but I'm going to call it compartmental depression. Now, I know that I've made this word up. There's no clinical word that describes this, but let me define it here so that we are having no, so we can all be on the same page. Then we'll go to scripture and see if we can put some meat on this thought. You know, let me first just define some words because there's great differences in these thoughts. Because sometimes we lump stress, anxiety, depression all in the same category and they're very, very different. You know, I'm just in just a very basic definition. Stress would be the gap between reality and expectation. So, so, so for example, let's put on this side of the auditorium, um, expectation, like over on this side of the auditorium, we have what we desire, um, what our career, how much we should be making, uh, what our children should be doing at this, this age, um, what successes you should have. This is your expectation. Everyone has, even the most person who feels they don't, aren't full of ambition has expectations for your life. And then over here is reality. Here's how much money you actually make. <laughs> and here's what your kids are actually doing. And here is where you are in this position in your life. And the gap between those is really stress. It's where you're trying to make these realities and expectations and draw them together. And some people live their entire lives in this middle and we would say they live in stress. Now that's, we're not speaking on stress, but at least this is a fine app. Anxiety, a little bit different. We're gonna take our back and we're gonna take our back and turn it to reality. And then we're gonna focus on expectation or we'll even say it like this, possibilities. Like, if, let's just say in your life, you're doing fine, you're doing well. But when your back is to reality and you're focused on what if COVID never goes away? What if our country never gets better? What if I never get over this disease? What if, see, see I'm so focused on what if that actually, even though in reality, I could be fine, panic attacks, anxiety, these things come, we would define that as anxiety. So, so let's not just lump these together, okay? A person who's struggling with stress is not the same person who is having panic attacks. These are, these are very different things. Then the last thing is, is obviously depression, which is a whole nother animal in itself. You know, I think, um, and I'm going to use a biblical reference to understand this word. I think the best word that I've ever heard to describe one word definition of depression would just be hopeless is where like 
You know, no matter how bad it gets in this world, there's something that's called hope that it can change. However, when depression sets in, see, some people look and say biblically, well, you need to just, you know, get in the Bible and do these different things. And I understand we do, but I'm going to be speaking on this a little bit tonight. But see, here is the fact that's different is listen to this verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, can you catch the first phrase? It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if you don't have hope, you don't have the stuff to make faith. You see what I'm saying? So like, like truly, like truly, like, like it it takes hope (laughs) to be able to make faith. And if you are drained of all hope, it's really hard then to then say, Hey, have faith. Well, have faith in what? Build what? So depression is a huge topic. Therefore, I'm going to then take it and break it down even further to my made up word of compartmental depression. In the United States specifically, we have very compartmentalized lives. Like it's rare that the work friends and the church friends intersect. It's rare that the school friends from college and this, like our lives are so compartmentalized that actually we have taught ourselves even how to live in this reality. So because of that, there will be some who would be functionally depressed upon a compartmentalized part of their life. For example, let's just say compartmentally, they have no hope in their marriage. Like you can talk about anything under the sun. We can talk sports, we can talk job, we can talk anything, but when it comes to my marriage, then automatically you see the face just just drops hopelessness because they're in a loveless relationship, that's just the way it's gonna be, they're not going to leave the guy, not going to leave the girl, but there's just no hope. hope, compartmentally depressed in this one area. Some compartmentally depressed in their career. Like we can talk about your career, we can talk about everybody else's career, but it's like, I hate what stage of life I'm in. <laughs> like this was not what I planned. <laughs> and so we can be able to function fine until we start talking about this area. So we can see how many times in our life, that this times that we're like, well, where did this panic attacks come? Where are these things coming from? And functionally, we have been doing life, but we have been compartmentally actually dying. I want us to look at this. The question to be asked is how do you breathe hope into a hopeless situation? Which would then just clinically meaning like, well, what do we do about this depression? Let's begin to look. First Kings, would you have common passage of scripture about this matter? When we look at probably one of the people that struggle with depression the most, first Kings chapter number 19. Some of you are familiar with the story. Some of you are not, but let's just go ahead and refresh our memories just so that we're clear upon this matter. So we're talking about the prophet. His name is Elijah. Elijah has just been mightily, mightily used of God. You might remember on Mount Carmel as they were there and the battle that took, well, the battle, well, the, essentially the contest that took place and God brought fire down from heaven. If you're not familiar with that, it's fine. Just know that he's come off of great spiritual victory. After that great spiritual victory, then comes Jezebel who issues a great threat. The threat is this, Elijah, you're going to die by tomorrow this time. As he getting ready to die, he then, you know, I mean, you would think a man who just took on this many prophets of Baal and everything would be fearless. But when it came to his own self, he didn't really have a lot of confidence. When he comes down, he, then we read that he takes his servant, leaves him Beersheba, and he just runs himself into complete exhaustion and is starting to have suicidal thoughts. Let's begin the reading in 1 Kings chapter number 19, verse number four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take my, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, rise and eat. He looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the Lord came again and the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Oreb, unto the mount of God. 
Now, let's just, here's how we're going to break down this passage. We're going to be going through more scriptures that are here, but here's how we're going to highlight it. There's three main characters in the passage. There's Elijah, obviously, and there's the angel, and there's God. Once we, make, once we clearly talk about those three main characters, then we will get to the one point that I want to be able to get to. And hopefully, because of the nature of this discussion, actually three takeaways for us to think about as we get ready to leave here. Let's answer this question. How is hope breathed into a hopeless life? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you take, use your word. Um, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for truth. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, I have to be here at Elm Grove. I don't take it for granted. Lord, I pray that you just, Lord, just make things clear. I know this is a heavy topic. There's a lot of questions surrounding it, a lot of things there that are uh, difficult, and there are things that some people are going through in this room that I, I have no idea, but Lord, I am confident that this is where you would have us to be, and that's why I pray that you'd use it for your honor and for your glory. I pray you would encourage hearts. Lord, I pray for those who are in the throes of depression. Um, Lord, they don't want to get up. Um, they... Life doesn't seem to have any purpose. I pray, Lord, that we would see hope breathe back. Use your word to do so. In Christ, we pray to Amen. Now, let's just, so we get to the story, and as he's running and running, the Bible says that he collapsed, most likely from exhaustion, under this juniper tree. As he collapses, the Bible introduces us to the first character that I want to talk about, and that is the angel. So Elijah is verbalizing. He's not just thinking it. He's verbalizing that he wants to die. It is one thing to have a thought of suicide. It's another thing to open your mouth and let the words come out. The words have come out of his mouth that he then would desire this. And so then the angel, the Bible says, does this. So I want to say part one, the angel. I really want us to focus in on this because the angel might be somebody's position that you know of somebody who's going to the throes of, of, of depression. Let's notice what the angel did not do. I don't want to live here, but the angel never tried to correct his state of mind. The angel did not minimize his feelings. He did not deny his feelings. He definitely did not try to compare his feelings to Elijah. He didn't say to Elijah, this is just all in your head. He never looks at Elijah and says, don't worry, this too shall pass. Of the angel came to Elijah knowing his state of mind. And what does he do? He gives the universal sign of kindness. He gives him some food. In any culture, in any place in the world, one thing that is always seen as hospitality, one thing that's always seen as a gesture of love, what does God say in chapter 3? He prepares a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, those who cannot stand me, I will have a banquet for them so they can watch me provide for you. So when you understand this, under, understand this in the beginning, that the angel did do this. He showed the universal sign of kindness. But oh, notice this. Arise is not as strong as it in the English, but usually in other languages, this would be the command form. It's just to understand you, obviously, in English. But understand these things arise, which means this. You got to get up and eat. You, you got to take care of yourself. Now, I, now, look, I am here for you. I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to sit here and sit here and correct every part of what you're doing wrong. You shouldn't be thinking like that. You shouldn't have these kind of thoughts. What's wrong with you? You're a Christian. No, 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 no. Stop, stop. He comes and he says, you got to at least take care of yourself. And gives him some food. Then what does he do? Let him sleep. Wakes him up again. You need to eat. Here's some more food. It gives them the food again. Now, now, understand, again, because even though I would really like to speak completely about the angel, because there are many who have family members that are in the throes right now, but I, let's just at least just note the angel's role in this. Now, let's continue to read. In verse number eight, and he arose and did eat and drink in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights into Oreb, the mount of God. He came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? So 
Elijah eats the food. As he does, he's now awakened. He now is thinking somewhat more clearly. In fact, we know he's thinking somewhat more clearly because he heads to Mount Oreb. Oreb is another name for Mount Sinai. Usually we would use that. We would use that because this is the place where, um, just think about in our culture and time, we would think like this, that a person who's really desperate, who's like on the verge of committing suicide and they're gonna throw one more Hail Mary to God, where would they go? To a church. Now, Mount Orb would be the equivalent of that. He knew his geography. He knew presently where he was. Mount Orb is a place where the Ten Commandments were given, the burning bush, all of that. Like, if there was a place geographically that you would go to hear from God, it would be the place where God broke down the Ten Commandments. So he's like, this is my shot. I am just going to go to where God is. Now, given the time it took him, he wasn't moving at a very fast pace at all. In fact, I mean, if you look at the distance, it's like, were you crawling? <laughs> like, of how long it took him to get there. But eventually, he does. He, well, he doesn't get all the way there. That's important to note. He doesn't get all the way there. The Bible says he comes to this cave. As he comes to the cave, God speaks to him. The Lord speaks and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? So enter part two. Let's now speak about Elijah. And he said in verse 10, he has his audience with God. This is what he wanted. He wanted to hear God's voice. And so what does he do? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts. Verse 10. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord is not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. This is interesting. He's coming out of the cave. God asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, like just straight up, just like, who are you here? And he's looking and he says this. He's like, oh, oh this is my tone. He says, this is my chance. He's like, Lord, look what I've done for you. Just keep in mind, Lord, I've been very jealous for you. Like, Lord, I have served you faithfully and I'm the only one left. Like, like there's no one who's like standing with me to do your will. And like, I just don't get like, so he's, he's pouring out his heart to God, which is fine. This is no time for fancy prayers. This is time for you to pour your heart out to God. So as he then, as he then is pouring his heart out to God, he's getting ready. He's walking out as he's going, because God says, go up to the mount before the Lord. So as he's making his way out of the cave, the Bible says, then he feels the earthquake. Well, and, and the, oh, the wind, the wind is first. So the wind, then the earthquake. Now, just so you know, these are obviously natural events. But if you, if you were thinking like Elijah, most likely, think about the times when these things happen. Remember, his destination was Mount Oro, Mount Sinai. Now, when the Ten Commandments came down, guess what happened? Earthquake, wind, right? So he's thinking, oh, God's going to come. This is going to be awesome. And the wind's going, and God's not in the wind. That's okay. Then the earthquake, oh, yes, this is so cool. God is going to come and give me the word. And he wasn't in the earthquake. <laughs> And there's a fire. Oh, he's going to burn in bush style. Ah, I got it. I got it. You know, and, and then here comes this fire and <laughs> God's not in the fire. Like, I don't know how long these natural events took place, but obviously as he's over here thinking that God is getting ready to do something very marvelous in front of him, like some type of natural event that's just going to blow his mind. Do you know then how God responds? Obviously it's in a still small voice. As he's in a still small voice, I believe it's very indicative that Elijah realizes that, you know what, Elijah, I don't have to come to you just like I came to everybody else. I, just because I've come in the fire before and did it for Moses doesn't mean now I have to then copycat and do that for you. Just because I did an earthquake or whatever it is, it doesn't have to look like what you think it should look like for me then to make myself known unto you. It's interesting. Much could be said, but again, we, we're trying to get to a point here, but in verse 13, and it was so, and when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in the mantle, went out and stood at the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, once again, what doest thou here, Elijah? <laughs> and verse 14, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts. He repeats it verbatim. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thine altar and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life 
to take it away. Now, before we get to main character of God, let's make sure we understand something about compartmental depression. Here is where I get it from. What was Elijah depressed about? If you look at his wording from the very beginning of the juniper tree, he does something that is very common, I find, in Christianity today, is performance-based Christianity. Like, he's like, remember when he collapsed at the juniper tree? His first words before he requests to die is like, I'm not better than my father's. There's, there's a whole lot more people better than I am. It, then he comes to this and he's like, Lord, I'm, you know, I've been trying. Like, come on. Like, like I've been really trying hard. Like, like, like come on. I've been like, like, what do you find? He found his identity and what he did for the Lord. Now, he, look, see, this is, this is where the gospel meets depression. And you got to hear me. Okay. We're getting a little bit nerdy, but follow me just for a moment. When the gospel meets an unsaved person, someone who is unregenerate, the person who's unregenerate must then realize, bro, there's nothing you can bring to the table to earn the gift of salvation, right? There's nothing. You just must believe that the Lord God of the universe loved you and paid your debt. The gospel meets this. Now, for some reason, we think that after salvation, that we hit some spiritual amazing plateau where now God is like, oh, you're so awesome. Like, like hold up, hold up. Like, see, many times what takes place is that we're forgetting the very song we just sung just moments ago. God loves you. Now, look, listen, listen closely. Let's follow this thought because it sounds so simple, but listen, this is how it works, okay? Is because God does not love you because you are a good mom. Because God loves people who are terrible moms. God does not love you because you have shown up at church faithfully for 30 years. He loves people who never go to church. My works don't do anything in this whole making God love me category. See, what happens is when I place all my hope and my performance, it works great until I fail. And then when Elijah perceives he's failed, he's failed, his then, his hope is now stripped from him because all along it was based on the fact of what he was doing for God and not the fact that God loved him. Listen, here's the one point that I want you to understand that's coming from this, probably for the whole message is this. I do not work for acceptance by God. I work from the fact that I have already been accepted by God. There is a complete difference because sometimes we will let our identity be wrapped up in what we do for God. See, I find it most Retired pastors. You know why? I had known a guy who was pastor his entire life. Like his name was pastor. Like he didn't even be called by anything else. Like that's who he was since he was like 21 years old. And I remember he went through this time and we were talking, he's a pastor up, up in the Northern region. And as we were chatting and stuff, he was talking to me about this. He says, Adrian, after I handed the range to this other guy come behind me, do you know how hard it is? Like, because his entire identity was being a pastor. Like, that was who he was. And then when it goes away, who am I? What, am I, what, what point do I have? As soon as you take the prophet title from Elijah, what are you? You're just a guy. What I'm saying is, is there any problem with titles? No, it's just realize that all the identities, dad, mom, pastor, teacher, preacher, all of these are identities that are collapsible. And when they collapse, baby, hope is gone. I have to place my hope in something that is unchanging. He is my savior. 
I am his child. And even if I am not a pastor tomorrow, I'm still his child. And even if I blow it tomorrow and do something incredibly stupid, I am his child. See, see, here's how it then. So how then is hope breathed back into a hopeless situation? Oh, you got to have something greater than hope to be able to breathe hope back in. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us what? Hey, there are the three things, faith, hope, charity. But the greatest of these is charity. So charity we know is greater than hope. So how does hope then get breathed back into my hopeless situation is realizing that I am loved by my creator. You know, say, Adrian, that sounds so childish. Oh, until you feel absolutely hopeless and think that there's absolutely no way because of the failure you have on your hand is greater than the love your Savior has. I think it's a great song choice, brother, because Jesus loves me. This I know. It's interesting because it's indicative by God's response, the last character in the story. Obviously, God. And the Lord said unto him, go and return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. It's interesting. You're going to notice in God's response to Elijah that God never even goes and talks about his resume and doesn't, he doesn't even talk about that. It's like, what, what, are, we, what are we bringing this up? Well, God, you love me because I know you're my creation. You work from the fact that you already have been loved by me. But he says, go return unto thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. Then when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king of Assyria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king of Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Adabloma, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. It shall come to pass that him that escaped with the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Now, this for us, again, doesn't seem to make such great sense. But just, just so you know, this would be like, God is logically going with Elijah through how this is going to be fixed. His whole thing was, there's no point. I'm the only one. Baal worship is going to take over the nation. And God's like, okay, look, I want you to, first things first, here's your job. Go anoint Hazia. Hazia was going to start the reform of Baal worship being in there. Jehu, if you know Jehu in the Bible and how he wrote furiously, you know good and well that he was going to eradicate Baal worship. He's like, do this, do this. I got this. Baal worship will be taken care of. That's where your heart is. I've got this. But God does one thing that does correct his thinking. He does say this, verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Do you know one thing God did correct? You're not alone. Stop that. Look, bro, you are not alone in this fight. I know that in the depths of many things, you can feel that every single being is against you. And as you begin to see and understand, obviously, you know, your heavenly father neither leaves, does not leave us nor forsake us. But he wanted to make sure that Elijah was not working from this premise of false information and going out from this place thinking that he was the solo servant of the Lord. Now, those are the three people. The one point, if I say it again, just so we're clear. I do not work for acceptance from my God. I work from the fact that I've already been accepted my, by my God because he loves me. Can I just take a couple of takeaways from Elijah's experience and then, put some, and then we'll call it a day. This is a part where I feel like, yes, it's strong exhortation. I hope that the realization of God's love does breathe back hope. And that's why, it, and let me just pause and just say this. That's why the gospel is so important. Like, I know it seems like it seems to be just a thing that keeps you out of hell. And it does. It does. But it's like, ever like do something with your phone? Like, I didn't know it did that. Oh, that's kind of cool. Then your friend takes a phone and be like, oh, I didn't know it did that. Do you know, that's why I do the gospel every day. Oh, I didn't know it did that. Oh, oh, I didn't know it reconciled with me with my brother. Oh, 
I mean, it just keeps going. Because everything is an outgrowth that he who knew no sin became sin for me. And every single day I am realizing, wow, there's something more awesome I am knowing about my God because of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some takeaways from Elijah's experience is number one, God loves you and he's showing his love to you right now. He told the disciples of the New Testament, rejoice what? That your name is written in heaven. He made it very clear, the second takeaway from his experience, you are not alone in the work, I've covered this, but there are layer protections within the body. By my friend, you will, truly, you will be alone if you always continue to never open the door when others are trying to be a help to you. So let me say some firm words. And lastly, as far as the last takeaway, I do see this though, because if you look at the story very carefully, it's interesting what you notice that I'm really going to hone in on and then give a corrective just instruction about this matter. And it says this, remember, let's go back a little bit earlier in the, in the passage. And it says in verse number nine, and he came thither into a cave and lodged there. So geographically, he's coming to a cave. Remember, he's running to Mount Oreb. He's coming to a cave. After he gets to a cave, he goes inside. Then remember verse number 11. God says this, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. God tells him, go to the mountain. He's in the cave, go up to the mountain. That's what God tells him to do, all right? Then in verse 13, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Wait a second. Elijah, your first time God spoke to you, he said, Elijah, He's like, oh, and he starts giving his speech. God gives him an instruction. Go to the mountain, go to the top. Then after that, he's going to the top. Oh, the wind, oh, the earthquake. Oh, God's speaking to me. Oh, oh, and guess what? He never does what God tells him to do. He's supposed to go to the mountain. He's so enthralled about everything he's seeing around him. He doesn't even obey. Now, now, like, now, now, I just want to make this application, just so we're clear, is, my friend, when we have no hope, let's go back to the compartmentally, have no hope in certain areas, there are things that God has asked us to do that, bro, we are drinking the poison and, why we, and wondering why we still sit. Like, for, let's just say, for example, some people are compartmentally depressed concerning our nation. I think it's a very common one. Concern our nation. We can talk about anything. As soon as we talk about the nation, it's like spirit dies inside of them. Now, you say, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to have faith and I'm, I'm trying to let God breathe hope because I feel so, but I feel like it's just, I feel, and you give all your reasons then. Now, now, it is for our responsibility though to identify hope killers with inside of our life. What does that mean? Bro, if you're watching three hours of news every day and wondering, I have no hope, come on. Bro, that's on you. I don't see the biblical mandate of watching three hours just helping us. What I'm saying is there are things you and I can do and we can't go to God, throw down our Bibles and be like, oh, he's not faithful to me. Huh? I was like, I told you to go to the mount. I told you what to do. For some people, it's like, let's just say about your compartment and express about your marriage. So here you are, man, there's no hope, there's no hope. And here you are on the internet, checking out your, your best buds back in high school and how, oh wow, she hasn't gained a pound since, wow, back in high school. Come on! What I'm saying is, what on earth are we doing in this case when hope killers are obviously in my life and if I have the clarity to see what these things are, it's on us. It's on us, man. With those things being said, it's like when I identify these hope killers and take care of the responsibilities that the Lord does place then upon my life, then it kind of opens my eyes and lets me have that breath of God's love and refreshing. Then I can come to church and it's just not a hymn. It is a reminder of my God's love for me. You know that God has said every single week on a Sunday coming and going to church, bro, if you know if God didn't command it, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> We would literally work ourselves into an absolute oblivion. 
We would acquire and build our little kingdoms, but do you know what God said? That you will take one day and it will be given to me. Why? So you can be reminded that I am God and I love my creation and I want you to worship me. My friend, when we get away from worshiping him, hopelessness is on the horizon. For some, you say, Adrian, I, I hear you. And I want to believe that God's love for me is sufficient, and I'm going to rest in that fact. But I tell you, Adrian, it just seems like I just can't cross over that hedge, and that, that hedge, and it just seems that my... In my spirit and my emotions, it just seems I cannot get to come along for this journey. You don't know how much it costs me and my spirit just to be here tonight. Do you don't understand how much it costs me to look in the mirror and slap my face? If it wasn't for my kids, I wouldn't even be showing up to work tomorrow. But I just know what I'm saying is, okay, I feel you. Okay. There's something in Hebrews 13 that I want to leave you with tonight. Hebrews 13, 15. There's a, a special offering that is given to God. It is called the sacrifice of praise. You know what a sacrifice of praise is? Is there are some days where it's pretty easy to raise your hand and say, God is good. Yeah, it really is. Like functionally, everything's fine. I mean, you wish you had a little bit more money and sure, you wish you might have been able to get that addition on the house and yeah, yeah, but you're good. You're good. However, there are some days where the preacher says, hey, praise the Lord. Ain't God good? And the amen doesn't flow. And there are some days where it is an absolute sacrifice to praise his name. And you know what God says? You know what he, he desires of his children? Is that in those moments when your emotions do not even follow suit, and when even though in your heart you may even say, God, I don't even believe you are good, but your word says you are good, and I am going to choose to let my emotions whisper and let what I believe scream. Therefore, God, I will still raise my hand to heaven, and I will then say you are good because you are God, because this is my sacrifice of praise unto my heavenly Father. There's it might just be that for hope to breathe back, you might need to make a sacrifice. He ain't asking for your house. He ain't even asking for your kid. He's asking for your praise. He's asking for you to honor when you do not feel that he is worthy of the honor emotionally that he deserves. Hebrews 13, 15 might be your moment to be able to cross over a hill that you have deemed uncrossable. Let us allow God to breathe hope into our hopeless situation. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for the Bible and what you teach us. Lord, I pray a special dedication prayer for those inside this room, Lord, who are struggling. Lord, in their hearts, it's heavy, heavy. Lord, there are certain circumstances, Lord, that the plastic smiles are really wearing thin and it's getting harder and harder to pull this Christian look off. God, I pray that they would not be resting upon their works of impressing you. But I pray tonight there will be a sweet smelling savor of those just thanking you for the things we know are eternal. Lord, praising you that I am your child. I am saved. I have a home in heaven. You're, you've given me your word. You've given me your son. You've given me your patience. You've given me your grace. You've given me your mercy. You are just and you are holy, but you still, Lord, poured out your wrath on your son for me. God, help us to think spiritually of all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. And I certainly do pray 
that as your love enters our soul, that hope can be breathed back into hopelessness so that faith may begin its work in our life again.